Welcome to So You Say, a podcast about the words we use, why we use them, how we use them, and how it affects our everyday life. Ultimately, we will be discussing the power behind our words. I'm Holly. And I'm Susan. In our time together, we're going to explore those common phrases that we say to ourselves and others around us, the impact that those phrases make, and how to avoid the unintentional negative consequences those words may have. So you say, we'll explore how even the smallest of words can have such a large impact for you and those around you. Hello, everyone. We're back again. This is our part two of the episode, I Have Lost Myself, on the podcast, So You Say. I'm Holly, and I'm joined again here with my best friend, Susan. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you doing? Not bad. We recorded yesterday, so I feel like asking each other how we're doing and what's going on seems kind of odd, <laughs> but... <laughs> this is true. But this is a first for us with the new podcast, with a new two-parter, so... Right, exactly. Exactly. But we, of course, are here to talk about the words that we use and how they can positively or negatively affect our lives and the people around us. On our part one, we talked about the truth behind, again, feeling alive and what that means, especially when we use the words, I lost myself. We talked about coming back to what brought you back to life or as we say, coming back to living, because it sort of ended up somewhat being the same thing. We discussed why this happens and what the signs may be, as well as what it is just to feel lost as you've gotten older and kind of moved away from those things that made you who you were when you were younger. And we left you with a question at the very, very end of our last episode. And that question was, what would you do anyway, every day, if no one paid you? We wanted you to sit down on this question, think about it, and we're hoping that you have done so and you are back with us to now get a little bit more into the nitty gritty portion of the journey that needs to be had and the things that you need to do to come back to finding yourself. Exactly. So when we left you, we left that question. Hopefully you've had a chance to think about it and maybe you came up with an answer. Maybe you came up with several different answers. So we want you to think about whatever your answer was, even if it was, oh my gosh, I I have no clue. I'm wildly lost at this point. I have no idea what I would do anymore. Any idea that I had, I shot down. I thought of all the reasons that I couldn't do it or didn't want to do it or wouldn't be able to do it. You know, and I just cycled and cycled and cycled and I don't know. That's okay. One of the things you did was you took the time to figure out and start to think about it. Yeah. And what that might be. And even though we did record this episode only yesterday, I did actually ask myself this question over the past 24 hours And I'm going to be real and honest and say that I was not able to really come up with something aside from doing photography. For those of you who don't know, I'm a photographer. I wish that I made more money doing photography, but I've also realized that it brings me so much joy that if I didn't make money, I would do it every day anyway. And there has been moments in my photography career where I've not made money. And that is tough to keep continuing on doing something when you're not bringing in any type of monetary value with it. And I will be honest, it's it, it's not something that's enjoyable by any means. <laughs> because I think we're conditioned as adults, especially, that most of what we do should give us some sort of financial support. And why would we continue on doing something if it didn't do that? 
And one of the things that I also do is I do a lot of volunteerism and that clearly does not pay me whenever I do it, but I do see the joy that it gives others and how it helps others. And while it can be sometimes very frustrating and very stressful, it's something that I enjoy and I don't get paid for that. What about you, Susan? Did you think about this one on your end? I did. And while I came up with something, I I was kind of left with that same feeling that you've sort of expressed, which is, oh, I know this, but I don't know. There's so much about it I don't know. So the thing that I came up with is I would want to run a farm stand. And as soon as I say that, there are a thousand other things, thousand little portals that open up in my brain and go, well, how would you do that? How would you get paid? How do you? And I tried to say no to that. Right now, I don't have to figure that out. I took some time to think about what I would do. I answered the question, what would I do anyway, every day, even if nobody paid me? And it was, I would run a farm stand. And I know that there's a lot, you know, again, you start to think and you go, oh my gosh, well, how would I make ends meet? How do I even go about doing that? How do I do this? How do I do that? That wasn't the point of the exercise. And I had to remind myself of that. I had to stop and say, nope. When I think about that, when I picture doing that every day, I I get a little bit of joy. And so that was part of the process. We want you to take the first step and figure out what makes you feel that little bit of joy and what it is either in the past or even in the, maybe the recent past or something that you've admired or always want to do. We want you to seek out that root cause. When I said to myself, I want to run a farm stand, no matter how kind of maybe unrealistic or ridiculous that might initially seem, what it did for me was it brought me that little spark of joy. And that was the point. So now that's my root cause. Something about saying that makes me feel alive, makes me feel like something that is connected to the core of who I am. And I don't have to fully understand it, but I've now got a little seed that's grown a little root and it's, that's the root cause. Yeah. What I find interesting is I did think about this question for you, Susan, as well. And one of the things I came up with was not too far off from the farm stand. It had to do with having a goat farm Mm -hmm. and that could be part of your farm stand. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And when I, like I said, when I, when I played with this question and that's the big key is that I took the time to just kind of play with it. I didn't, I didn't, because it was a question I was asking just myself, I avoided having to feel responsible to asking anybody else. I didn't ask my partner, well, what do you think I should do? I didn't reach out to friends and family and parents and siblings and everything and say, what do you think I should do? I took the time to say, I don't have to answer to anybody. I don't have to say it out loud. I don't have to write it down. I can just play around with it and get right down to what is it? What's that one little object that makes me feel happy and grounded? And that's what I came up with. Yeah, that's the thing about this question. We don't want you asking other people. Mm -hmm. We don't want you getting the opinion of others on this. We want you to think about it for yourself. And you did make mention of to find the root cause, figure out what it is that made you feel this way. That's always the beginning of everything, right? Finding the foundation to what got you here in the first place. And sometimes that cannot be the easiest thing to do. Sometimes it's really hard and it takes some really, really deep, deep digging into yourself to figure that out. Well, I think part of it too, is that when you talk about what you would do every day, if you're not, if nobody paid you, what you are kind of talking about is dreams. And once you put a dream out there to other people to be judged, then it's very easy for that dream to be dismantled. 
You know, it's basically like as soon as you wake up and you shine the light of day on it, then it, it starts to fade and it starts to go away. And we are used to doing that. We're used to kind of sharing our dreams. We've always, as a society, I think we talk a lot about like, follow your dreams. What's your dream? Blah, 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 blah. We're constantly asking people that. And in doing so, I think think we we're coming from a place of trying to be a motivator or positive or supportive but that same line of questioning for a lot of people can cause people to go oh well maybe my dream's not what you pictured or maybe i don't know how i would do the dream and i'm afraid that if i tell you you're going to ask me questions that i'm not ready to answer and so that's why we want you to practice with playing around with this. And you may answer one way one day, and you may answer a different way on another day. And that's okay too. Because as you ask yourself this question over and over, you might start to see a pattern. Maybe one thing doesn't look like it connects to another. But, you know, as you said, the idea that, you know, I, most people who know me know that I love goats. It would be a very logical thing that if somebody were to say, what do you think Susan's dream is? It's to say, oh, it would be to work with goats. And yeah, you're, you're not wrong. That's a part of it. That's how it all kind of ties in for me. So the more that I think about things and the more that I look at what has brought me joy in the past um, what makes me feel joyful doing, what makes me excited for in the future, it kind of comes down to this central idea. And the more that I talk about it and think about it, the more concrete the idea can become. Yeah. The second thing that we wrote down was to put down the phone and focus. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one that we can all relate to. I think this is one that we can all completely agree with. I think in this day and age, we definitely depend on our phone for a lot. And while that can be very good, because I'll be honest, I much prefer getting into my phone, clicking my movie app and finding out the movies within 10 seconds <laughs> instead of picking up the rotary phone, dialing a number, having to listen to every movie and every time. And then if I missed it, I got to listen through it again. And that could take 15, 20, 30 minutes. So while there's major benefits, of course, in regards to just saving time on the phone and on the internet and all these things that end up taking a lot of focus away from other things, we also have to know that we are taking focus away from other things and recognize that and look at what it is that maybe we're taking the focus away from. If yeah. we're looking at our phone and focusing on our phone and we're spending the time on our phone. And one of the things that I like to do, because my phone does this, and I'm sure that everyone else's phone does this too, is it keeps track of the amount of time that you spend on your apps. And if you go back and you start to see how much time you've spent on social media, then that might, you might think to yourself, well, shit, you know, I got to start realizing I spent four hours on Facebook today. And now I'm telling myself that I don't have time to sing or write or photograph or garden these things that I really, really love to do because I claim I don't have time or I claim I don't have energy, yeah. but you do have time. And you do have energy and it does exist. You just have to, again, we've talked about use your coins. Everyone has 24 coins in their day mm -hmm. and use them in the best way that you can. And one of the things that you can start to do is to stop focusing on your phone and put it down unless you really need to use it. And I will be honest, I am really, really bad at this. <laughs> I'm really uh. bad at this. Same. I think we all are. I do. Yeah. I'm going to play devil's advocate because I know there are people out there right now that are going, well, wait, Holly, uh, you know, because of my phone, I'm, I'm connected to others and I'm able to pursue. I'm listening you know, to this. Things. Yeah. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm looking, you know, if, if maybe your dream is to be a songwriter, I'm looking at, you know, I'm looking at other songwriters, blah, 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 blah. But 
again, what it comes down to is there's nothing wrong with using your phone and by extension, social media to look at the opportunities that are out there. Look at the things, relook at things through a different lens and say, do I still have a passion for this? What makes me feel alive? It allows you to explore. On the other side of the coin, what it does is it also allows you to kind of escape into what others are doing mm-hmm. so that you don't have to do for yourself. So you're almost kind of living vicariously. So if you're a photographer, but you're not going and you're following all these different photographers on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and all the different social medias and, you know, gosh, even if Tumblr, I think is still around, still a thing people are looking (laughs) at, um, you know, that's great because you can look and you can see all these different styles, but if you're not going out and photographing, that's where you could kind of feel lost. If you identify as, you know, if this is your root cause, your thing that made you feel alive but you're not doing it. You're allowing others to do it so that you can kind of ride on that coattail of feeling like you're doing what you love to do. Then that's where that, that thing that can really benefit you becomes a detriment. It becomes a crutch. Yeah. The other thing that I've realized myself as well is we have a tendency to use our phone in moments where We are waiting in moments where we're bored, in moments where we feel awkward. We have a tendency to pick up our phone in these moments. And I've had to teach myself, and a very good example is the one I'm going to give, but I've had to teach myself that just because it's quiet, because I'm waiting, because I'm sitting, because I'm not doing anything, doesn't mean that's a great time to pick up my phone. And what I did once and I'll never forget it, and I've been doing it since, but this was the first time, is I would go to the chiropractor and I would be sitting in the waiting room to be called in to be worked on. And I decided today, that day, um, today I'm going to not go on my phone while I'm sitting in the waiting room. And I waited in the waiting room for about 10 minutes and every single person in there was on their phone waiting. And instead I closed my eyes and I meditated during the time I sat in the chiropractor's office. And when the chiropractor came out to bring me in to work on my back, he actually thought I fell asleep. (laughs) And he said to me, he walked over to me and he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, am I waking you up? And I opened my eyes and I said, no, I actually was just meditating. And the exact words out of his mouth were good for you. And while it might be embarrassing to a lot of people to just close your eyes in the middle of a doctor's office in front of strangers, no one is going to look at you as if it's weird. Nobody was paying attention. Right. No one's paying attention. I think this is something we have to realize that we rely on our phones. Instead, maybe what we should be doing is putting our phone down. There's no reason to be on your phone there. Nine out of 10 times, I can guarantee in the office waiting room of a doctor, you know, you don't, you don't need to need to be on your phone. So instead choose something that will more benefit you through that moment or through that day. And meditating before you go into the doctor is a really great idea if you can do it. Yeah. And what you're tapping into really is that idea that we've lost the ability to do nothing. Right. And in our moments of nothing was when creativity could come. Yes. You know, we, we, writers will often talk about the creative muse. How do they find the creative muse? And a lot of times it came up from moments of peace and quiet when your brain was allowed to just be, and it wasn't distracted. It wasn't filled with ideas. It wasn't trying to figure out what was next on your to-do list. And again, that idea of being lost, if you just are running your brain constantly, 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 and you don't let it have that moment of quietness, whether it's through meditation, whether it's through just doing nothing and being comfortable with the idea of doing nothing, you don't give your brain the break that it needs to spark creativity to spark thoughts of what 
do I want to do? What brings me joy? As a kid, I think we're, when we really feel like we maybe connect with something, because oftentimes people will talk about, oh, I used to do something. When I was younger, I used to do something. I used to dance. I used to do this. I used to do that. Well, you were able to do that because you weren't constantly filled with electronic media and entertainment. You had the ability to have the time to be quiet and, and think about things. And then in return, you were energized enough to be able to go and do the thing that you loved. So, yeah, I do think while I, while I will say that as a devil's advocate, (laughs) there is a time when the phone can kind of connect you back with maybe what you loved, what you have to watch out for doing is having it be a substitute. Don't live off somebody else doing the thing that you want to do. I'm guilty of this. I'll tell you, my Instagram feed is filled with little farm stands. (laughs) And so I do recognize that I will look at these farm stands and I will go, oh, that's so beautiful. So I do recognize the kind of dichotomy of me sitting here and saying, yeah, you have to be off your phone a little bit, but it's true. You do need to take that space back so that you can think about the things that bring you joy without having to put it out there and being beholden to everybody else who's going to see it as well. All right. And the next one, which is my favorite, is create and do for you, not someone else for you. And this one's going to be hard for a lot of you because I think that if you are a creator, one of the things that we love is getting money, getting paid for what we do. But the truth is, is that we should create just to create because it makes us happy. And if that money comes after the fact down the road, then that's fine. But we shouldn't go back to creating if that's the thing that made us feel alive to do it only because it's going to be done for someone else, because someone else may need it from us, because someone else will pay us for it. We should be starting on that journey by doing it for yourself first. And then if somewhere down the road, you happen to get paid for whatever it is that you're doing, then great. But don't go into this journey to go back to finding yourself after you feel you've lost yourself to start by pleasing other people first. Do it first for you. That's exactly it. It is about doing it for yourself. And that's the reason we're asking you to do this exercise. That's the reason that we asked you to ask yourself that question and not to reach out to others and crowdsource your idea. The idea when you are feeling lost is that you do need to get back to who you are. And nobody else can do that for you ultimately in the end. So to put that journey into other people's values is going to limit you because you're always going to be stifled by whatever is outside rather than looking inside of yourself. So again, if you're thinking, well, I can't do this thing that I love because it isn't going to make money. And if I don't make money, I'm not going to be able to support those that I love around me. Or what if I do this thing that I love and somebody says to me, well, that's ridiculous. Why would you do that? Those are all the excuses that got you lost and feeling out of yourself in the first place. So we want you to give yourself permission to look right within you and try to only please you. Let this be your little personal journey. Let this be the thing that you hold on to that you decide is strictly for you. And then again, if it ends up being something larger in the future, that's wonderful. But for now, to get yourself unstuck and and feeling not lost and feeling like your authentic self, you do have to make it about you. Yeah. And we're not just talking about being creative. We're talking about being creative right now because we are both creatives. And that's the first thing that we think of. But this can, again, 
as I mentioned, create and do for you. It can be do whatever. It can be running. It can be meditating. We've t- we talk about meditating a lot. Don't sit down to meditate with the thought, I'm going to meditate so I can be better for my kids. Sit down to meditate so that you can be better for you. Be a better you. And that way you'll make you ultimately better for your kids. So whatever it is that you need to do to come back to being you, put yourself first. It is not selfish. We have talked about this in a past Mm -hmm. podcast. If you want to go listen to how being selfish and self-full exists, it is two different things. Please go back and listen. It is not selfish to go back and create or do for you that something that makes you happy. Exactly. And now that you've focused and you've made that time and you've decided that you're going to commit to you, what's that next step in this process? Well, the next step is to set a goal or in some cases set a dream. Depends on what you're going to be doing to try to get yourself unstuck and finding yourself when you're feeling lost. Seek out a future. And it doesn't have to be a perfect future. You don't have to know every little thing that's going to happen in that future right now. But if you're not willing to move forward, if you say it's always going to be like it is right now, one, you are kidding yourself because the only constant (laughs) in this world is change. And two, you're not allowing yourself. You're not freeing yourself to try to figure out what it is that will keep you from feeling lost in whatever role you've taken on. Again, as Holly's talked about, we focus a lot on creativity because we're creative people, but you can find yourself lost because maybe you've been a dutiful wife for years and suddenly you're faced with a divorce and everything that you thought was your world has been shifted you know, maybe, maybe the rug's been pulled out from under you and you're, you're feeling a little bit like you're in free fall and you're feeling lost during those times. Yeah, of course it's hard to dream and to seek out a future, but that's what you need to start to do. You need to realize that this moment right now of feeling lost is just a moment and you can move forward. You can find the focus make the time, turn into yourself and look inward and seek that future, it's going to make you feel a little bit less lost, a little bit firmer in where you are in your life. Yeah. And we did say set a goal. And I want everyone to know that goals don't have to be these big, grandiose things. They can be little things. And with a past career or past experience as a fitness instructor in the fitness world, when people would come to my class and I would ask them, well, what's your goal? They would say, well, I want to lose 50 pounds. And I would say, that's a great goal. But how about we just start by losing one or two? And then we'll go from there. And I remember when I first started wanting to lose weight, one of my goals was I just want to be able to wear a crop top and feel good in my crop top. And I know that sounds crazy because to most people, they would think, well, you can wear a crop top today. Anyone can wear a crop top. But for me, that was a big goal. That was a big deal. And it was something that I really wanted to do. And that was my first little goal. So we can make baby step goals. That's fine. In fact, I suggest making baby step goals. I think that's actually a better way to go about it because honestly, it doesn't set us up for failure as much. And we also feel we are accomplishing more and we will accomplish more by making baby step goals. You can have lots of goals. You can have lots of dreams. If you make them smaller, it's easy to attain them. Now, we are going to move into the important things to stop doing as you decide to come back to life when you feel like you've lost yourself and you want to make that journey to finding who you were and finding who you want to become. And the first thing that we have talked about so much over and over in every podcast is to stop the negative self-talk. And I am just as guilty of this as anybody else. 
And it has been a very, very tough journey to get past doing that. But you need to stop talking negatively about yourself. One of the things that I will never forget, and I remember this conversation came up between me and Susan many years ago, was we were talking about talking badly about ourselves, And I said, why do I do this? And Susan said to me, yeah, I don't know why I'd do it either. Cause I wouldn't talk to you this way. And I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, I wouldn't talk to you this way either. So <laughs> why am I talking about myself like this? Why am I telling myself that I'm ugly or that I'm stupid or that, you know, whatever it is, whatever the negative self-talk is become your own best friend. Would I say what I'm saying to myself, to my best friend? And if you wouldn't, then you probably shouldn't be saying it to yourself. And then two, let's say that you go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would totally say that to my best friend. Okay, well, but maybe that's not the right thing to be saying right now. Maybe you can hush that. Maybe you can shelve that for later on or down the road, or maybe even never put it up on the shelf and just forget about it. Hush it for a little while. So you've mentioned Susan progress, not Mm -hmm. perfection, knowing that we are not meant to be perfect people. In fact, what is even the definition of perfection? Well, we've talked about that one too. And this journey of stopping the negative self-talk is about knowing that no one's perfect. We don't need to be perfect. That all we have to do is just keep progressing, just keep practicing, just keep putting in the hard work, and we'll eventually get there. The next thing that we wanted to talk about was to stop giving yourself too much to others. And this includes your children. And I know that we've just pissed off a whole bunch of people out there because so many people say, I put my kids first, I put my kids first, I put my kids first. Now, while we understand that and we completely get it because you should always put your kids first, let's say it again, you have to put the mask on yourself before you put it on anyone else. Yeah. And putting your kids first doesn't mean every single time putting them ahead of you. You can see, as we said, with that idea of finding your passion, that children are always watching you. They're always looking at what you do. They're not always looking at what you say. So it's wonderful that you can say that you put your children first. If they see that you are also doing and you're caring for yourself, they are in return going to learn how to care for themselves. And it is always about a balance, but we're not just talking children in this case, when we're talking about being lost, we could also talk about partner, a job, you know, a role in our life. If you're a caregiver, obviously there's a lot of pressure on you to put somebody else before yourself. But if you wear yourself down, you're not going to do anything good. And they talk about that with caregiver burnout. And that goes right along with this idea of feeling lost. When you have nothing left to give, you're not good for anybody, no matter what your nobler intention is. When you have nothing left, you have nothing left. An empty cup cannot pour. You cannot give to others If you've not given to yourself, you have no credit to spare. So that also includes to stop getting overly absorbed in things that you don't need to be. We talked about social media, but that's just one example. One that I love to talk about is we don't need to be absorbed in drama We don't need to be absorbed in people's bullshit. (laughs) We don't. This does not do us any favors. In fact, if anything, it makes us feel worse about ourselves. It makes us feel worse about our friendships. And while it might be really hard to cut off our friends because we feel being around them may be just too much for us at the time or maybe permanently, we all, again, we talk about this one too in a past podcast, how to have those conversations and maybe it might be time to let that person go. And if you become too absorbed in things or people or your job, Mm -hmm. then more than you need to be, 
then that is just taking up time in your life and energy and positivity that could be spent doing the thing that you lost that you need to come back to. Well, and if something were to happen to that thing that you're holding on to, that you're overly absorbed in, the job is a perfect example. Nowadays, it's very easy for a job to come and go. So if you're so absorbed in that career, in that job, in that whatever, that you leave nothing for yourself, if when that job shifts, goes away, changes into something that isn't bringing you the satisfaction that it did prior, you are going to find yourself incredibly lost if you've built your, going back to the Jenga analogy, if you've built your life on a few precarious blocks and one gets pulled away, the whole house is going to tumble. The whole thing is just going to come crashing down. So that's why we want you to stop focusing on certain getting so absorbed into one thing or another. Yeah. I think this rolls nicely into the next one as well. Yeah. Stop thinking that you are going to be exactly who you used to be. Yeah. You're a different person now than you were back then. You might have a different role. You might have less roles. You might have a career. You might have kids. If you were a really, really good dancer, and now that's not as possible because you're older, you could just simply have aged and now your body just cannot perform in the way that it used to, that's okay. It doesn't mean give up. It doesn't mean stop dancing. It means that you can maybe bring dance into your life in another way. And to accept that you are not who you used to be and you are a different person now. And that is a hundred percent. All right. We're not asking you to try to go backwards in time. None of us can do that. What we're asking is that you focus on the feeling and don't be so stuck with the image of what it was. When you take the time to focus, when you have those moments of quiet, when you're off your phone, you can think about how you want that dance experience at 60 to look like, because it's not going to look the same in your 20s. You're not the same person in your 60s that you were in your 20s. There is no way that you are. And that's a wonderful thing about life is that we are constantly changing and evolving and reinventing ourselves. So it's about finding what the passion is, what the thing is that that you can ground to, that makes you not feel lost, but don't be so locked into what it's supposed to look like. Be open to the idea that you can maybe find that passion in a way that you don't expect, that that you weren't doing in your 20s. Which brings us into our next one, Susan. Mm. Stop having regret. This is probably one of the hardest ones. I'm sure we've all said at one point, I wish that I didn't stop doing fill in the blank. Well, if we keep thinking negatively, which is really, that's a negative thought, then we're never going to be able to move forward. We have to let go of the regret that we may feel from the fact that we may have given up whatever it was that we loved and we have to move on and move forward and let go let go of the regret and realize, again, this is a new life. You're a new person in a new journey. And while you can bring back whatever it is that made you who you were before you lost yourself, know that regret is not going to help you. It will only actually create steps backwards in your journey to move forward. Self-reflection has a time and and a place, but When you're feeling lost, being mired in the past isn't going to help because that past is what kind of brought you to this spot. No matter how much you may romanticize what that past feeling of being connected and and finding your authentic self may have been, it is still romantic because it's in hindsight. Yeah, and society is also really good at being the static Mm -hmm. And this is when I say to people, ignore the static, ignore the opinions, ignore the things that you may hear that aren't good for you. There's always going to be haters. There's always going to be people out there who are going to say, why are you doing this? 
What's the point? What are you going to get out of it? Well, happiness, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really, that should really be the ultimate goal. If it makes you happy, then that's enough. That's it. That's enough. If it brings you back to the person who you lost, that's enough. But people are still going to say it. It's always going to happen. So just ignore the static, ignore the haters. They will be there no matter what. As the saying goes, you can't make everyone happy. Exactly. <laughs> and in doing that, in, in, igno- in recognizing that there are going to be people who will never understand, you know, whatever it is that your passion is that makes you feel grounded, that makes you feel authentic, you can also s- begin to seek out a group of like-minded and supportive individuals who do see that, who do understand it. They may not understand your exact thing because they're not in your shoes. They're not in your body. They're not in your skin, but they can, you can still start to develop and find what I like to call your tribe. And I think that's a pretty common thing that we hear quite often now is that when you begin to find your authentic self, when you begin to pull yourself back from feeling lost and get into more of what makes you, you're going to attract people around you who are going to recognize that within you. And if you're lucky, if you're really being true to who you are and to what you love to do, you're going to find that there are quite a number of people who probably see that same thing and are going to be supportive of that journey for you. And if they're not, then maybe you need to question, what is this person in my life? If they can't support me toward my happiness, then what are they in my life? And it doesn't mean you have to get rid of them, but you may just have to give them a different role in your life. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't be as close to them. Maybe you don't you know, hang out with them as much, whatever it is, but understand that if there's people who don't support your journey toward happiness, because this is really what this is about. When you've lost yourself, these people, you, whoever feels this feeling is not happy. There's something missing. There's a void and that needs to be filled. And by filling that void, you're going to be filling yourself with happiness. And if those people around you who you believe care for you, don't support this, then maybe you need to kind of reevaluate that friendship or that person in your life and make that step as well. This has been a tough one, which is why we wanted to talk about it over two parts. I really, really loved talking about this. And I know that probably of all the episodes that we've recorded, this is probably going to be the one that really gets to a lot of people in ways that maybe... You don't want to hear. This is the tough love. Oh, absolutely. This is the tough love. There's going to be things I'm sure that people are going to, and I want you to, please reach out to us and tell us, you know, what what connected for you? What maybe didn't? What could you say, oh, I really want to do that, but I face this challenge. That's okay. Again, we'll say it until... The cows come home and the sun sets and everything. <laughs> and your little it, farm stand. And my little farm stand <laughs> closes for the evening. That it is about progress and not perfection. We recognize that a lot of what we're asking you to do is going to shift you outside of your comfort zone. It's uncomfortable for us as well. But we're. It's going to feel impossible too. Yeah. It's going to feel impossible. We're all trying to do this together. And again, I'll go back to, I think for me, the most impactful thing is this idea of setting goals, little obtainable goals, and giving yourself the freedom to know that you can have as many of those little goals as you want. You can change them up whenever you want, and you can customize and create them, and you can celebrate each little individual goal as you get it. And how amazing is that? Nobody's going to restrict you. Yeah. The pennies add up, Mm -hmm. right? Little pennies will eventually add up and it may take a long time, but you'll get there and you'll see, you'll see the impact that those little tiny goals will make. And I think we're at the end of this one. I want to thank 
you, Susan, again, for joining me, of course, again. And I'm going to ask you to drop that social media. All right. So one of my little goals was to get these (laughs) right. So you can reach out to us at so you say pod at gmail.com or you can hit us up on Instagram at so dot you dot say dot podcast. And that is our Instagram handle. We want to hear from you guys. Uh, how did you answer the question? What's the challenge? What's the step that you are going to take today? If you are feeling lost, and I think we're all a little bit lost together. We're all a little bit lost together. We talked about this. Yeah. In part one, you're not alone. Right? So what step are you going to take today to make the answer to that question a reality? Yeah. Thank you all again for being here, listening to us and giving us your ear. And we hope that you all have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye.